Hi, I'm John the Engineer Termel, and I'm going to be watching Bill Still's video. He is a candidate for the Libertarian uh, nomination for President of the United States. He's a money reformer, has money reform videos. Of course, he's got his Shift B inflation, doesn't know about Shift B, thinks it's all Shift A. <clears throat> doesn't focus on the interest at all. I don't think he mentions it once, though he does point out that he can save all the interest if he uses his Lincoln Greenbacks. And then he doesn't support Dennis Kucinich's bill to use Lincoln Greenbacks. So I congratulate him in many places and I beat him up in others. This is worth the time. So this is the Still Report number 45, Bill Still at Philly. Uh, so it's great to be here uh, speaking to an audience where the first reaction is not to tra thrash me within an inch of my life, <laughs> which is the reaction I usually have to work against speaking at libertarian events because, of course, they're heavily involved with uh, Austrian economic theory and gold bugs and all that. So it's kind of like swimming upstream every time, but here I'm, I'm so much nicer. About 15 years ago, uh, this was the pre-9-11 truth time, uh, these conferences were all very patriotic events, pretty much focused on upholding constitutional values. America was the last bastion of freedom, etc., all things that I currently support. <laughs> I believe this nation is the best hope for changing this debt and money vulture system that hangs like a black cloud over humanity. And of course, I got no problems with debt money or asset money. Doesn't matter to me whether the chips are backed up by cash in the cage or IOU markers in the cage. Debt or asset, it's the interest that gums up the money. So I always object when people talk about the problem being debt money when it's debt money with interest. And I always keep forgetting the positive feedback that comes with the debt, which they decry against the debt, the national debt. But it's the positive feedback on the debt that's the real problem. Back in those days, there were only two monetary reformers out there, me and Byron. But there was uh, some older gentleman who always manned the table at the back. I forget. Do you remember his name, Byron? He always had Lindbergh's books and Wright Patman and all that. You know who I'm talking about, though? He was... Dan Pillow! Nice to give a guy who was fighting for monetary reform in the early years all alone credit. He was the only other guy who wasn't a hardcore gold bug. And I just want to tell you all, why, this, is, this is interesting, that you don't know the history of it, but there's a reason why the monetary reform solution is not better known in this country, and that's the ascension of Austrian economic theory in the past 40 or 50 years. Byron's nodding his head. And that's, that's why the gold bugs are, have absolutely taken over the monetary reform discussion. And Yeah, for some reason they think that we should be digging for gold so that we end up playing with golden chips rather than print up plastic or, or paper or wooden ones. This is just a temporary and transient phenomenon. Yeah. You know, the, the head of the whole gold bug. Well, sorry, it's 5,000 years transient, but yeah, it's the end of the gold standard of money to be replaced by the time standard of money. A theory is Ludwig von Mises. Yeah. Well, you know who brought him from Austria? You know who paid for every, every day that he reigned as a professor of economics or whatever the heck his title was at New York University? The Rockefeller Foundation. That's why the gold answer is the false solution. And for the past 15 or 20 years, I've had this vision that we are going to come to a point yeah. where we see a serious economic downturn. We just saw a little one a little while ago. We're going to see a serious one. And at that point, the, the, the international-based, gold-backed money solution is going to be rolled out, and they're going to try to sell it to us. Come on. Now that most people are aware of how casino chips work, how are they going to explain why we need yellow rock chips as opposed to copper rock or any other kind of rock chips? <laughs> and all I've tried to do with my life in monetary reform is to, is to head off, head them off the path at that crisis point and have sufficient people aware that there's another alternative. 
That's right, they really are gold nuts for believing that that was ever a solution and that gold ever worked to anyone's advantage except the gold bullion brokers. Because it's going to come. And... You know, too bad he can't say the other alternative is time-based currency. But yes, I know that coming is coming. Anyway, then, uh, and of course, I'm, I'm going to say something that's probably unpopular in this audience, but that's never stopped me in the past. Uh, then the 9 11 truthers came in to the whole conference circuit uh, and uh, basically changed the focus 180 degrees. Suddenly America was the evil empire. We were a fascist nation. Uh, so suddenly, instead of getting no press coverage at these conferences, suddenly Telemundo showed up, the Venezuelan news service. And of course, why do they show up? Because they just eat it up that America's a bad place. And so therefore, our system must, you know, the, the Venezuelan, the communist, the whatever system is a better thing to try. That's what they're all about. And that's, that's what I don't support. And so, uh, after hearing so many people talk yesterday, especially that young lady that got up here, I think we should encase that young lady in a plexiglass bubble and just feed her and give her an internet connection. <laughs> and she can just take over. She's already a lot better spoken than I do. Oh, that's Victoria Grant, and I gave her essay and speech an A minus because of the usual shift B inflation misunderstanding. Well, I'm, I'm always very optimistic. I, I've, I've had tried to live my writing career by two standards that are important. I've never written a word that I wouldn't want any of my four children to read. And number two, and most importantly, I've never written a word that gives a hopeless message. There are, Me too. There are two. These are the two worst things that we can do as writers. Our children are, our children are the ones who we must inspire to greatness and goodness, or all of our efforts in monetary reform will be gone when we die. And secondly, and most importantly, a hopeless message is the worst possible thing that we can do, worse than offering the gold standard as a viable solution. Why? Because if people think there is no hope, they will not fight. They will not come to these conferences. You can't inspire a hopeless message. Got any gold? Everyone in this room uh, believes that the most important power of the sovereign is the money power. All we have to do is take that back in the hands of we the people, however that plays out. So I've been working on... No, you got to take it back and get rid of the interest rate. He misses getting rid of the positive feedback on debts. It's causing the imbalance. This is a contrary reform concept a long time, like 30 years. Uh, about 17 years ago, I produced The Money Masters, which consistently ranks in the top 25 most watched films on the internet. Okay, uh, so, and Naomi Prince, a former director at Goldman Sachs, described The Money Masters in Sinista Magazine as, quote, doing a superb job of revealing the truth behind the Fed and the powerful global financiers whose self-interest has dictated our banking system from the beginning. Uh, now let's take a, a look at, uh, at this guy, uh, Ron Paul. Is one of the primary problems for us monetary now. reformers. One of the main reasons that everybody is still so confused. Correct. Now, Correct. I like Dr. Paul. For years, he's been the voice of anti-Fed forces, but where he goes astray is the solution, the gold solution. Yeah. We all agree that the problem is that the quantity of money is out of control. Dr. Paul thinks. No, 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 no. The quantity of chips is not out of control. That's not the problem. The quantity of foreclosure is out of control. Gold was going to fix this. And this is my axiom on that topic. It matters not the facts of money. All that matters is who controls the quantity. We... Well, actually, it does matter what backs the money and who controls the quantity. Well, that's automatic at any casino cashier. If you've got the collateral, they got the chips. They don't want a gold-backed money system. We were on a gold-backed money system during the Great Depression. It didn't right. do a thing for us. That's right. All that matters is who is in control. We, the people, have to take back control of the money system or we're never going to get anywhere. But that's not enough. you got to abolish the positive feedback on the debts. Now, it just makes sense. I mean, do, do you want the, the great...
greatest power of a sovereign nation in the control of an unelectable banker? Or do you want it in control of somebody who's elected one way or another? I don't care how it happens, just so it's out of their hands and somehow closer to being in our hands. I don't have all the solutions. I don't pretend to. Let's hear from Bob. I do. Just run it like poker chips. No involuntary unemployment, no inflation, enough chips for everybody to get in the game. He doesn't have all the answers. Yes, we know. He admits it. But he's close. I don't like the idea that they have monopoly control. It's a cartel. They get to print the money. And uh, the Constitution really doesn't give them that authority. The Constitution said that only gold and silver can be legal tender. Uh. That drives me crazy. He said only gold and silver can be legal tender according to the Constitution. Where does it say that on? Okay, as I say in my book, just how many incorrect statements can you make in 12 seconds? <laughs> uh, so for the past 40 years or so, the gold bugs have completely dominated the talk of true monetary reform and been able to successfully pigeonhole the greenbacker solution yeah. as nothing but wild money printing. Yeah. If we're not going to control the quantity, why would we even be here? That's the whole... We want to control the foreclosure. We just want to let the amount of money go wild if we come up with a lot of collateral. ...point to have a stable economic system. That's the very definition of, of economic study anyway, to create stability. That's what we're trying to do. And in electrical systems engineering, when you have an instability, it's called a pull in the right-hand plane, like interest rates, which cause a positive feedback, the only way to get rid of the instability is to turn it to zero. You've got to get rid of the interest rate. It's the only instability in the whole 1 over S minus I Laplace transform of the banking system equation. And he hasn't mentioned interest once. But the gold bug ascension to power is starting to wane now. And that's why I went directly into the heart of the beast on this worthless quest. Uh, I shouldn't say worthless quest, because it's being recorded. <laughs> In any case. <laughs> so, the Libertarian Party is America's third largest political party. The one place where the gold bug political activists are the most firmly entrenched. My mission to begin to plant was to begin to plant some seeds of truth, and it's been pretty effective. Now, I'm not going to win the Libertarian Party's presidential nomination one week from today at their national convention, but I did way better than I expected to. I've consistently come in second in most every state's straw polls where I've been uh, in the presidential debates. So who is going to win? This is the guy that's going to win. Now, I looked into the Libertarian Party in the 1980s when I was an independent and thought maybe I'd join them because I approve of all their social issues. But uh, I was evicted from their candidates meeting because they said that everybody should have the liberty to loan shark to their neighbors. <laughs> and I wanted to take away that right. Well, no, I don't. If you want to loan shark to your neighbor, fine. As long as he's got access to interest-free credit down at the bank on the corner, if he's stupid enough to choose you, I don't care. Uh, former governor of New Mexico, Gary Johnson. He was a failed Republican candidate before he suddenly dropped out of the Republican uh, race on December 28th and announced it. But the best thing is he wants to legalize marijuana too. Advocate, good one. That he had really actually been a lifelong libertarian <laughs> and brought his $250,000 worth of debt, which he'd accumulated in the Republican ah, the Libertarian Party, something they're completely against, but somehow they've ignored that. Um, so, is he an improvement over the Democrats and Republicans from a monetary reform perspective? Uh, that's his face there on the right. You can't quite see it, but this is campaign material that he put out. <laughs> Here's a recording of a radio appearance he made at a Georgia radio station just two months ago. Unfortunately for him, my appearance occurred two hours after his, and the host said, boy, that guy said some really crazy stuff and gave me the tape. Uh, <laughs> Borrowing is okay, printing money, that's what we need to stop. We <laughs> oh, oh, is that stupid? Getting the debt's okay, but printing our own chips, we gotta stop. Oh, sad Mr. Johnson.
Federal Reserve. There's this misconception that the Federal Reserve is some private entity. We, U.S. taxpayers, we own all the stock in the Federal Reserve. Surprise! <laughs> I'm asked, what about uh, criminal prosecution of those on Wall Street? You know what, it's probably because none of them committed any crimes, none of them committed any crimes, and none of them committed any crimes, and none of them committed any crimes, and none of them committed any crimes. Okay, shoot. He's beaten up on his libertarian opponent for the nomination. I understand, you know. Going into the abuses, as opposed to the systemic malfunction, diverts people's attention. So I wouldn't have spent any time talking about this angle. None of them committed any crimes, and none of them committed any crimes, and none of them committed any crimes, and they just made some incredibly bad decisions. Oops! How do they remember the three stages? <laughs> Okay, crashes are caused by just one thing, and that's bubbles. Bubbles. <laughs> all right, now, first of all, there's never been a crash in a casino, but presuming that there are bubbles, then there must be crashes. So let's go on. Bubbles are caused by just one thing, and that's by banks being in complete and total control of the quantity of the American monetary system in complete contradiction the U.S. Constitution. All right, so cashiers being in complete control of the chips causes bubbles, and bubbles crash, whatever that means. <laughs> um, secondly, mortgage were, mortgages were sliced and diced, and they were sold multiple times. The same mortgage simultaneously was sold in multiple arenas. Diversions is clear fraud. Clear-cut theft, and it needs to be prosecuted for the force Chase the bad guys. Okay, so as you can see, I'm not going to win. Well, the point is, we can chase the drivers of the malfunctioning machine, or we can go and try and fix the machine. There's two different goals here. One's tactical, one's strategic. I don't think there's a single person in this room who can claim to have invented anything new in this field. We are all in this together. And Whoa! I did. I invented the equations, proven what he's saying. That if you got the principal and you owe P plus I, and you've only got P, a certain number of guys got to get knocked out of the game so the other guys can pay their interest. Mortgage means death gamble. It's an elimination game just like musical chairs. Yeah, I came up with the equation. I just invented it 30 some years ago. That should be comforting to all of us, we, that we are indeed on the right track, that these same truths keep popping up over and over and over again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nehemiah wrote, let the exacting of interest stop, let I equal zero, same result to my equation. And uh, Jesus said, if you have money, do not lend it out of interest, so he figured out you can't pay 11 when they only printed 10, so yeah. And so we were safely wrapped in the purifying, truthifying arms of history. Absolutely. Okay, so uh, this is Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. I just want to go, th go through these two here. Incidentally, did you know that as late as World War I, 90% of the federal budget was funded through duties, imposts, and excises? Of course, this is a direct contradiction to, to the Libertarian Party platform, which believes in open borders and free trade, and that's going to set me off on a whole other thing. Minutiae. How we use the system, not how we run it. Okay, now, now let's look at clause number two. I've got it highlighted in blue there. To borrow money on the credit of the United States. This is the only thing I have against the Constitution. That's right, that's Guess right. what? I'm in pretty good company. Yeah. Uh, to Thomas Jefferson, clause two was the biggest, if not the only, defect he saw in the Constitution. I wish it were possible to obtain a single amendment to our Constitution. I would be willing to depend on that alone for the reduction of the administration of our government. I mean an additional article taken from the federal government the power of borrowing. And consider this. If the federal government could not borrow, they would automatically have to balance their budget. Because if they spent more than their income, Congress would have to be... No, no. It's not that they would have to balance their budget, but their budget would have to always be balanced. Get the difference? It's not like they got to live within a budget. 
Budget's the wrong word. When you've got a source of interest-free chips, and as fast as people bring you new work as collateral, you're given new chips, this consideration doesn't come up. You'll have wrath of a voting electorate immediately because they'd have to raise taxes to pay for the spending immediately. Nothing wrong with raising taxes to pay for more spending if you're paying for what you got and not for any debt service. Example, King Henry, he took a stick of wood, wrote 10 pounds of gold on it, split it in two. One half was the tally, one half was the stub. It's due for taxes. He spent the tallies, the upkeep of the realm, and at the end of the year, he taxed them back. And they had to tally up. And that was King Henry I's uncounterfeitable government money. So... The point is, it's the tax that makes the money valuable. As soon as King Henry spent his tally to build that bridge, and he then levied a tax at the end of the year for, you know, one-tenth of a year, uh, decade's worth of the life of a bridge, that became a valuable tally because it had a function paying tax. This is around this topic is the current term coin money. So the gold bugs are medalists. Uh, this means metallic coins only should be authorized. I also noticed that, that I included the next clause uh, to provide for punishment of counterfeiting the securities and current coin of the United States. Oh, 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 what about those fractional reserve lending guys? So let's uh, move on here. Um, in, in a lengthy but definitive paper in 2008, Professor Robert Nate. The fractional reserve lending guys are creating those credits in their computers, not with metal, with paper. Nadelson of Harvard explained the meaning of this, the coinage clause, as follows. Coin, even in monetarist Britain, meant payment of any kind. The verb to coin could mean to make or forge anything, represented today by the common expression to coin a phrase. So, pursuant to the usage, paper money could be coined. And, just like you can coin a phrase, I guess you can coin an equation. I did. But the Supreme Court has ruled as well on the acceptability of paper money under the coinage clause several times. In 1870, Hepburn versus uh, Griswold, 71, Knox versus Lee. Uh, Knox versus Lee was upheld in court challenges in 1872, and also the famous and final Juilliard versus Greenman case in 1884, which caused Professor Murray Rothbard, the king of the gold bugs in academia, to say, <laughs> from then on, paper money would be held consonant with the U.S. Constitution. It's settled law now. It's not even a debate. Good stuff. Paper okay, chips so are okay. Jackson quote, which unless you understand the difficulties of the definition of coin money, this quote is difficult to understand. If Congress has the right under the Constitution to issue paper money, it was given to them to be used by themselves, not to be delegated to individuals or corporations. Truer words were never spoken. However, uh, so in this case, there's been, uh, it's been my argument in the past, and it's been pretty effective, but just this week, a superb new nugget of information has been added to my armamentarium by Scott Baker, the public banking head for New York. And Scott, could you raise your hands? Everybody knows who the heck you are? He, uh, this, is, this is just great. This helps things so much. Uh, Scott sent me this, this uh, commentary on why the framers worded the Constitution this way. On August 16, 1787, the framers' final vote on, on money powers delisted paper money, lest it excite the opposition of the monopoly bent money interests. And to be and be used to exploit a general paper money phobia, so as not to altogether exclude it. Before voting, Madison obtained firm commitment that the delisting did not disable the government from the use of public notes as far as they could be safe and proper. Public notes, guys, don't you love that? The phrase yeah. cuts to the heart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah, what's yeah. going on? Instead of bank so notes. Here we see that Madison had to compromise with the money masters of his day in order to get the Constitution passed. The intent is clear to those who study these things at length, but easy to obfuscate by those determined to muddy the waters. So this is the first time that I've been able to appreciate the pressures Madison and the other founders faced on the money power. 
Now let's talk about what Dr. Paul is confused about. Article 1, Section 10. <laughs> uh, coin money and then bills of credit make anything but gold or silver coin a tender in payment of debts. This is what this is what Dr. Paul interprets to mean that only gold and silver can be legal tender. That is such a crude, in my view, and desperately deceptive interpretation of the Constitution that it completely mars Dr. Paul's reputation in history going forward. He completely ignores that this is a prohibition for the states alone. The problem this tried to remedy was that state banks were issuing their own fiat banknotes without any sort of regulation. No one in Virginia knew the value of state banknotes from New Hampshire. The idea was to federalize money in an effort to regulate the value thereof. And besides, has any state ever, ever paid its debts in gold or silver coin alone? <laughs> Dr. Paul and his followers should hang their heads in shame for this deliberate misquoting of the Constitution. Another interesting item, Scott Baker. Good news! that there's no legal reason not to be able to use paper instead of yellow or silver rock. It was this impressive petition, which all of you should consider signing, called uh, for calling for Congress to reissue debt-free notes. I do have one problem with the wording, however, and uh, the, the favorable mention of the Kucinich and Conyers bill, the Need Act, H.R. 2990. Other than that, it looks, uh, looks to be something good that we all should be supporting. Oh, he's not supporting Kucinich's bill to replace the Fed with Treasury notes and do American infrastructure. And of course, that's very minor. Now I want to go into this Kucinich bill. Uh, it does advocate the use of greenbacks, debt-free government-issued money in the public interest. However, the bill has some severe... Okay, so it does advocate what he wants, but he's got problems with it. Your flaws. In this bill, the monetary authority, the body which, uh, which has within its authority levers of power, which the Fed currently has to control, the quantity of money is way not democratic enough. Power. Who's the cashier? Is way too consolidated. This is the most important power of a sovereign nation. It must be deconsolidated to the. Hey, let's give everybody a good paying government job doing something useful and then talk about the board and how consolidated it is. Wow. The maximum extent Nick Picker. is politically practical. Here is the act. Shame. In section 302, it states that the monetary authority will be under the Secretary of Treasury. My comments are in. Who does he want to be the cashier? Blue. Uh, is anybody comfortable with this? I I'm am. Being under the Secretary of, of Treasury? I'm certainly sure. not. Even despite the subsequent enhancements in sections B and C, and this is the Kucinich Act, remember, trying to be more specific, I'm completely uncomfortable with this. This is a power choke point uh, in this bill that is completely, a completely un No, it's not. Who the cashier is for the U.S. Treasury greenbacks is not a choke point, as long as they've got enough to put people to work. Jeez. What a nitpicking, lousy excuse not to help. Necessary over-consolidation of power. Step one. The second problem is the composition of the monetary authority. Nine members of course appointed He doesn't by like the, the composition of the board. Terms. This is exactly how the Federal Reserve Board of Governors is constituted. Instead of it issuing paychecks to put people in the work, let's work till he, wait till he president. fixes the board. And the president yeah. even designates the chairperson. Again, my comments are in blue. This is all right out of my book. Uh, but I look, look forward to talking to people about this uh, later today. Now here's the way this should go. Since this monetary authority is only authorized by implication, Article 1, Section 8, regulate the value thereof clause, the actual way that this should be accomplished would be to default back to the Tenth Amendment of the Constitution. For those who don't remember it, like me, until I got into this, uh, this is what it says. The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution nor prohibited to it by the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. The monetary authority should be completely independent and composed of members from each of the 50 states. Sure. Maximum deconsolidation of sure. power. And it should not be beholden to the Secretary of Treasury. It should only be responsible and accountable to the individual state legislatures via their duly elected or appointed representatives. Okay, this is uh, another thing. Uh, Who would have thought the cashier at the poker game had such power? Uh, uh, that was sent to me. Uh, this is a, a lawsuit filed by Cliff Johnson of California, filed in federal court in California. 
Uh, and in it, he asks that a few hundred billion, not a trivial amount, trivial amount, of U.S. notes be used to make Social Security payments, thus retiring that amount of debt. His lawsuit also contends that misleading statements about the effectiveness of U.S. notes on Treasury's website are making it difficult for him to pursue his case. Whoa. So here's an interesting discussion between the judge, Judge Alsop, the plaintiff, Mr. Johnson, and Treasury's attorney, Mr. Perlman. Judge Alsop, why don't you stand on the street corner and tell passers-by you're trying what you're trying to do here, Johnson? I do. Me too. Judge Alsop, surprised. Then what's the problem with that? I can't get through. No one knows there's any difference between U.S. notes and Federal Reserve notes because the Treasury says there's no difference. And that's a misrepresentation of simple facts. Yeah. And it's an intentional authoritarian misrepresentation. It distorts the public debate. Uh, this is the uh, defense attorney, or the, 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 the government's attorney. Uh, we're going to file a motion to dismiss on Monday, Your Honor. And then Johnson says, I should add that there's an amendment I need to make. It's an election issue. The libertarian candidate, Bill Still, has expressed support for this case. Libertarians have a greenback platform, not exactly true, but uh, which is what the case <laughs> is does. about. So should I amend this uh, uh, as an election issue, maybe cite the candidate as a non-interested party? On hearing this, the libertarian, uh, that the libertarian candidate had expressed interest in the case, Al Sepp's eyebrows raised and he suddenly got professional. Johnson said that he believes the judge would have dismissed the case without my name having been brought into the suit, so perhaps uh, this has done some good. Okay, now let's look at Tungsten and Gold Bars. Uh, for years, this story and many different flavors of it circulated on the internet, but a couple of weeks ago came the first visual proof that it was true. It's probably the biggest slap in the face for the gold bugs imaginable. Metalists have always argued that gold is a reliable store of value and free from the ability of the money masters to manipulate the quantity. But check this out. So here's a perfectly good picture of a one kilogram on a gold bar, which you can't see very well. And here's the top half of it, it's been cut in half. And then here's the side view, uh, clearly showing, can you see them? Oh, they've been abusing gold. Who cares? That's not the malfunction we got to fix. Uh, that 40% of the weight is taken up by uh, tungsten rods. The gold bar was bored and the tungsten rods were pressed into one end. Tungsten is an ideal substitution for gold because the densities are remarkably similar. The problem is that who in their right mind would want to cut into their one kilogram gold bar to discover that it's actually a fake and therefore worth 40% less than they paid for it? The implications of this are huge. It's, it's just so great to be a monetary reformer at these times. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, now here's another, uh, for every gem I get, of course, uh, there's a hundred false trails. And this is one you probably heard of. I'm almost to the end, it's okay. Um, <laughs> Like this one from the Drudge Report, it says that Iceland is making plans to forgive mortgage debt for all of its citizens. So how many people have heard about this? A lot of people. It's just completely bogus. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, exactly. um, so I, I checked this with my friend uh, in the Icelandic parliament, Brigitte Jones' daughter. Uh, Brigitte is the lady who's in my film, The Secret of Oz. Uh, yeah, this just reminds you who she is. Why are governments pumping money into private banks? Why are they not letting them roll? I mean, just like any other. And then the excuse is, oh, they're too big to fail. <laughs> Let them fail, please. Let them fail? Fix Isn't it them. wonderful how this is just like universal truths? <laughs> it's almost an admission that they don't know how to fix them if their only answer is, let them fail. Okay, so here's her email back to me. Dear Bill, I'm sorry to say that this must be some sort of joke. I'm gathering facts uh, versus fiction in order to respond to this, and we'll post it on my blog this week. Now remember, this is, Brigitte is the leader of the anti-IMF forces in Iceland, the leader of the Icelandic protest movement, which goes out and surrounds people's houses who are about to be foreclosed on with human chains. And this has stopped foreclosures in the past. She would certainly know if, if, if this was the truth. Um, this is the per And you know, I got the reputation from the media as bank fighter extraordinaire in the 80s when I had anti-foreclosure kits. Just like a criminal could stall, stall, stall before going to jail by appealing, appealing, appealing. Poor people could stall, stall, stall foreclosure by appealing, appealing, appealing. And I showed them how. The hero of this thing is Bob Marshall. I know him. I've known him for a long time. We refer to him as Virginia's greatest living legislator. He's a conservative Republican. He's just 
he's right on everything, that's all I can say. During the 2010 legislative session, Marshall stunned the nation by something else that's more along our lines, by proposing a study commission, I think it was the very first uh, state to do this, to study the feasibility of a state-owned, state-chartered bank, the Bank of Virginia, along the lines of the Bank of North Dakota. The measure was tabled, but this year Marshall introduced it again, this time it's named H.R. 12, and that's it. Unfortunately, a subcommittee called the House Assigned Rules Subcommittee tabled bill again, killing it for this year. So now it's time for me to get on my presentation. Monetary reform rests on two great pillars that are I refer to as inviolable. In other words, you have to have this to make it work. Uh, no more national debt and ending the Federal Reserve System. Okay, you could operate with a national debt if the government borrowed interest-free chips from the Bank of Canada, spent them, and then taxed them out with no interest. So having a national debt isn't terrible. It's, or you could simply spend money debt-free, as they say, to keep track of how much is out there. So, but it's not primordial when the problem is the growth of debt on money. I mean, yes. And whether or not your chips are issued through a fractional reserve system, again, is not crucial. Fractional reserve lending means that the casino can't lend out any new chips until someone makes a deposit of old chips over at the safety deposit section. Then they get a call, say, okay, someone just dropped off 100 chips at the safety deposit section. You can now lend out 90 new chips. Well, that's a pretty stupid way, and except collateral for 90 new chips. Well, that's a pretty stupid limit on the number of chips you can issue in exchange for collateral, as opposed to the natural limit, which is how much collateral you got. That's how many chips will issue. But they have this artificial limit based on how many chips are deposited over there to make the suckers think they're getting the same chips, the savers deposits, and they're not. So remember the big lie of economics that one of them, that ba bankers do not lend out their depositors' funds. So fractional reserve banking is stupid, but not evil. And of course, you can have a national debt if it's interest-free that won't hurt you. So both these solutions aren't solutions. They aren't two legs to stand on. Only let the exacting of interest stop is the proper leg to stand on. If you want to fix the 1 over S minus I, equation of the banking system. Uh, public banking is a great adjunct to these because it deconsolidates the money power by pushing it down to the states as per the 10th Amendment. And if you still got interest, you still got a foreclosure department. When in doubt about anything in this arena, I always go back to voting for deconsolidation of power. You'll never see people rioting in the streets, oh, the government doesn't have enough power. No, it's always the other way around. Somehow the cashier needs less power. Not. So, this is how big this $500 billion interest on the debt figure is. Ah, I'm good. We quoted $440 billion. Uh, I think the CBO uh, just said in this FY, we're going to see $540 billion in interest payments on the national debt alone. How big is that number? We only spend $19 billion on all of NASA, $7 billion on the National Science Foundation. 20 billion on the CIA, just these listed, that's only 160 billion. And yet we're paying 500 billion dollars a year in interest on the national debt, something that is entirely unnecessary. <laughs> that's right. Why represent our wealth with their chips for a fee when we can represent our own wealth with our own chips for free? He's basically saying we don't have to pay the interest on the debt if we run it ourselves. It's the first time he admits there'll be no interest on the debt. He just never bothered mentioning the senior highlight, even once. Gee, you got a hint it all the time? Okay. $500 million. That's, that's equal to the entire discretionary budget of Congress. This is how big that number is. And now, according to the CBO, in 2020, that will we exceed a trillion dollars a year, just interest on the national debt alone, something that is entirely unnecessary. Okay, so the national debt equals loss of democratic control. The borrower is certain. No, an interest-free national debt is not a loss of control. You've got as long as you need to pay for it. Servant to the lender, according uh, to Proverbs. Yesterday we heard several presenters... Yeah, that, 
borrow a servant to the lender when he's got to cover his debt service. Call this autocracy, <coughs> but you know there, there's really a better word for it, and that word is plutocracy, ruled by the rich. That this is what the entire last thousand year march of humankind has been all about. How to Five thousand, maybe ten. Read David Astle's book, The Babylonian Woe, for how long the gold bullion brokers have been pulling off the scam across the whole planet. ...political systems that will allow the majority to escape serfdom. That's what this has been all about, the Magna Carta, the Charter of Liberties before that, uh, right down to the U.S. Constitution. We are rapidly devolving back into this plutocratic state, and no matter what your political perspective is, everyone worldwide senses this. They just, they're completely confused about what to do about it. You know, if you have an, a, a, an illegal enterprise, a fraudulent enterprise, that, that raked in multi-trillions of dollars per year, you can afford to spend a couple of billion dollars on PR just to keep people confused. And that's exactly what's going on. The mainline libertarian position, which just drives me nuts, is, is that government is too corrupt to fix the problem. Aye. Half the libertarian party are these anarchists. You know, they think a oh, government just won't work. <laughs> yes. It's a party, and you're going to have national conventions and try to elect president candidates, but you don't believe in government. <laughs> I'm going to have to point out that uh, the Public Banking Institute is Ellen Brown's organization from which I was ejected. So there's no one there to correct their mistakes on everything I pointed out here. And that's why they're still present in Bill Still's video. So, but still, if he ever got elected president, I think he'd be an easy one to talk into using Lincoln Greenbacks like Dennis Kucinich's bill would do, except he'll want a different kind of a board and someone else being in charge of the cashier. <laughs> okay? I think that's a real cop-out and a completely loser strategic move because the Kucinich bill is a great first step. Proves it can be done. Puts people to work right away. He's going to deter putting people back to work with nuclear spills that need to be cleaned because he doesn't like the composition of the board. Come on, Bill, wake up. So, other than that, go learn your lessons. JohnTermel.com slash bankmath.htm for my advanced engineering analysis with Laplace Transforms and find out that the problem's only the feedback on the debt that generates the inflation and the unemployment. So, yeah, everybody believes that inflation is too much money. Well, yeah, it can be too much money chasing the goods, but it can be the same money chasing less goods after foreclosure. And that's not taught in economics. I'm the only person who teaches shift B inflation. So anyway, Bill, do your homework. I hope you do well in your campaign. You know, I approve of money reformers running. If only they could learn their shift B inflation and... They're, well, you know, you're in focus on the interest, the positive feedback, watch you go.